How's everybody doing today? In this wonderful paradise of Maui. Yeah. Glad to be here. I'm going to, my name is Mark Ryan, and I'm going to be the one to introduce Joe Vitale and Dr. Len. And I'm going to talk to you, ramble on here for a little bit. Those of you that know me, I have a tendency to be a little hypnotic and go all over the place. And when I'm talking, I'll do my best to keep it fairly linear here. Um, this uh, last night, my girlfriend Kathy was asking me a question about looking around at all the beautiful people that were here and the, the great event of the Luau for those of you who were here. And she asked me, she says, do you realize that if you hadn't introduced Joe to this, that all these people wouldn't be together? And, you know, there's part of us sometimes that wants to push things away and not accept it. And that part was going on, and I was like, well, maybe yes, maybe no. You know, this might have happened anyways and probably would happen because, to me, it's, it's about the energy, what Ho'oponopono is doing, what the divinity is doing. And it's, it's that process that the divinity does through us brings us here together. And so whether it was me introducing Joe to it or somebody else, it was meant to happen. And the other thing I got thinking was, what if everybody in this room made this happen? What if all of you individually made this happen and caused me to be introduced to Ho'oponopono and then introduce it to Joe so we could all be here today and then take it out into your lives? How much farther can that go? And what's going to happen after this event? Hi, come on in. So I will uh, start off back. Uh, we'll, on, on the way we were flying out here, we, uh, there was a young lady back of us that lives on Maui, basically lives out of her, her vehicle and has some pets with her. And she started talking about the volcanoes in Hawaii had started going off last week, I think, again, some of the volcanoes. And they were flowing red rivers of lava. And it brought me back to a memory when I was a kid. And I remember reading this book as, as a child, and it had this uh, lava flow on it. And it had uh, green, uh, a lot of green, plush green, and then had uh, houses that the lava was coming close to. And this book was about this young man that lived um, on the big island of Hawaii and what it was like to live close to a volcano and be around a volcano with the fear of the lava coming towards the house. And a lot of times when a volcano goes off, it gives a foreshadowing that it's going to go off. It'll give rumbles. It'll give a little bit of smoke going up in the air. People know the, dome, the lava dome will start coming up. People know that this lava, it gives a foreshadowing. And I think what happened with me, what's happened through me throughout my life, and as we talked to Joe and Dr. Len and yourselves, there's foreshadowings of things, things that you can look back in your past and say, were these little signs, were these little foreshadowings of what's happening now, what's to come? <laughs> Excuse me. When I was in the military, I met uh, a friend of mine. He was a roommate of mine when I was in Germany, and he was a Hawaiian, and his name was Howard Salmo, a good friend of mine that I'm getting ready to go see on Monday. And it's been 30 years since I've seen him, but he was just an amazing individual, and he taught me a lot about spirituality, and he would talk about some of the spiritual traditions of Hawaii, and what went on here and what the, some of the kahunas and the different healing techniques and how the language is really a healing language and the language is meant to bring positive things into your life and to bring healing into your life and I'm probably not explaining it as well as Dr. Len could or Howard could but it was it was a magic and he would try to explain a lot of this to me and tell me some of the the miracles and things that would happen I wasn't ready for it at like 17 18 years old but it was a foreshadowing. It was kind of a, a rumbling of what was to come, I, uh, even to the fact of Hawaii Five-O, watching Hawaii Five-O. I used to love that program and be really drawn to the island of Hawaii and, and what was going on and the people and the culture that were there. <laughs> Excuse me. I got a little bit of a cold or flu that I'm still cleaning on here. Then uh, some, when I started getting to NLP and training with that, some of my teachers that I, I really started training with, they had – also lived on the island of Hawaii and Maui and in different places throughout and studied some of these ancient techniques and they had come up with a process um, that was their own version of the whole ponopono that they had been taught so again it was a foreshadowing of what was to come it was a different yet similar type of whole ponopono than you're going to learn over this weekend at the zero limit seminar and many 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 of those things have happened as a foreshadowing of this event 
when I was in um, Mount Shasta, there's a lot of synchronicities that happen. I used to go there every year for about 17 years. I had a little booth there and uh, started selling sunglasses there and did very, very well. And so I would drive from upstate New York every year, every summer, to Mount Shasta like a pilgrimage. And the synchronicities that brought me there, all the things that happened along the way. And I have a, a good friend of mine. His name is O.B. Newman. And new man, O.B. New Man. So I'm always saying, you know, O.B. a new man, which he always is. He came up to me one day and he says, you know, for some reason, I, I feel like I have to give this to you. And it was a pamphlet folded up with one of our other friend's name tag on it. And he goes, it's just, I think you're going to be interested in this. And it had blue lettering all over it, like a purplish blue lettering. And I say, okay, I'll take a look at this. And they had gone and seen Dr. Len uh, for an introductory session. I think it was on a Friday before that. I went through, I read it, and it blew me away. And the, the, the great thing was, like, I got it. And again, let's go back to foreshadowing. Dr. Vitelli recently had had his book, Adventures Within, which is a personal tale about his uh, spiritual growth and what had happened to him along the way. I had recently read that book, and in that book, it talked about the Book of Est from Warner Earhart and how much he uh, liked it and enjoyed it. So I went out and got the book. It took a long time for me to get it because um, all the libraries didn't have it anymore, and they couldn't figure out. They're like, we don't know why people are taking this book. Well, I went to eBay and found out there's $95 because they're not printing it anymore, so I knew what all the college students were doing with the books to make a little bit extra money and finally got one, a special edition with a credit card from Cornell University and read it. And that book talked about being responsible. One of the chapters of it was being responsible for your world 100%. And I had to keep reading it over and over again. It was a simple con uh, concept, but it wasn't clicking in my head. I just couldn't get it. But yet something inside of me, that foreshadowing, knew it was powerful. It was really powerful. So I kept reading it, and then one day it was like, oh, I got it. I got it. And then it wasn't too long after that that I went out to Mount Shasta and got this little pamphlet that talked about 100% responsibility. And I think it was an article from the Seattle Times. It was a New Times magazine or something where Dr. Len had done an interview, and I got it. It made sense. All the stuff that, and it, it was a similar type of foreshadowing that was recognizable within me. And that, that process there, through reading it um, and getting excited about it, I knew that there was going to be something happening with it. It was something big. A lot of times I talk to Joe and I get these intuitions and I say, I don't know what it is, but it, they come in these packets and it's like everything is there with it. And I know what's going to happen with it, but not necessarily how it's going to unfold. And soon after that, it was about a month later, I think, I, Dr. Vitelli had asked me if I would help volunteer with booths because I had been doing the sunglasses. I knew how to run booths. And he asked me if I would go up to the NGH, which is the National Guild of Hypnotherapists up in uh, I think it was New Hampshire at that time, um, Nashua, New Hampshire. And I was fresh off of this experience of reading his book and then getting the pamphlet and reading the pamphlet and getting it and understanding it. And there was something in the foreshadowing because he resides in that same place within me of that same energy. When I met Joe years ago, that same type of thing happens. like, this guy's going to be my friend. I don't know why I know this, but I know this. This is, this, he's going to be a good friend. So it was a foreshadowing that was in that same area. So Joe was kind of on the cusp with his spiritual marketing book and uh, doing all the marketing of that spirituality. But I knew from Adventures Within that if he got this concept, that it would change the world. There was something about it. Again, my girlfriend asked me, she goes, did you, did you realize what would happen with this once you told Joe? And I'm like, yeah, I realized that if I, could, if I could get him to get it and understand it, I knew what was going to happen. I knew what Joe was possible, what, what was possible if Joe understood this and what he could do with it. So the first year I went to the NGH and was talking to Joe, I was like, how do I bring this up with him? And I started talking to him. I asked him, I said, have you heard about this therapist, this doctor, psychiatrist in Hawaii that never saw any patients? I mean, took on a patient. I guess, the, you know, Dr. Lynch saw him walking around looking at him in the court, but healed him. 
And at the, at basically the hospital had to close down, which Joe will tell you more about and Dr. Lynn will tell you about. I said, hey, did you hear about this guy? And all he did was pray over him, basically say the Ho'oponopono exercise that you're here to learn. And he kind of looked at me funny. And I told you, you know, because he knew I'd just come from Mount Shasta. He says, What's, what happened to you out there in Mount Shasta? That's kind of like a, a little weird what you're talking about. And I said, no, no, it's great. Anyways, he never really took on at that that year, which is about four years ago, three, four years ago. And um, we did the booth, sold out, sold real well. He goes, man, he said, we really did good. How, you know, it was energetic. Narissa was there. Joe was up there. I was there. Uh, Telman Knudsen, I think, was there. So we did very, very well with this seminar, or it, uh, selling his products at the booth, and asked me if I'd come again next year, and I said, absolutely. So a year went by, and this time I came to the seminar started right away the first day and poor Narissa we were setting up and Narissa was in the the back of the room um, and I told you I asked her I said do you ever check into that therapist that I was telling you about the guy that could heal just by doing this whole pono process he goes you know something's been getting me about that he goes tell me more tell me more and I started telling him more and he'll tell you about it and he got excited really excited and said Narissa do you mind watching the room now this is first thing it's starting and thousands of people that are going to rush Narissa and me and Joe are leaving to go get on the internet to check out stuff about Dr. <laughs> Len. So the, uh, once, once he did that, um, I knew it had taken, that the same thing that had taken inside of me had taken inside of him. So then it was up to me to support Joe in whatever way I could with this knowledge. The, uh, when I first saw the picture of Dr. Len in that little article, he reminded me of my friend Howard, who I'm going to see, and uh, in Hawaii. And those volcanoes, he has a place that's right by those volcanoes. Pahala is the name of it. And he's got a house there, and I'm going to see him first time in 30 years. And his house is close to these new volcanoes that are going off. So I start to see, again, the foreshadowing of what's happening there. But he had, even though he was a couple years older than me, he had kind of an old wisdom to him. And, and it was a, like a grandfatherly, wise type of a wisdom to him. I always looked up to him, even though he was a couple years older. When I saw that picture of Dr. Len in that, I got the same thing. I said, Something, something's here. Even though he's still a young man, I had that grandfatherly, fatherly type of, yeah, I was like, wow. It added to it, again, a foreshadowing. Same thing I had with Dr. Joe Vitale when I first met him. So... Without further ado, I want to introduce these two great men that hold a special place in my heart. And I want to let you all know that it's a simple idea that's very complex. And the complex part of it is understanding the simplicity of it. It's simple. It's easy. But yet there's a lot of stuff in the way to see in that simplicity. But if you'll trust that place in your heart and you'll trust Dr. Joe and Dr. Len, I think they're going to resonate with something inside of you. I know they'll resonate with something inside of you that will absolutely change your life and, and what you do in life. So without further ado, Dr. Joe Vitale, Dr. Len. Thank you. I love you. Excellent. Good morning. <laughs> I met almost everybody last night, and you all seem to be incredibly excited. I want to know why. What do you think you're going to get? Really, anybody. What do you think you're going to get? What are you excited about? Something that's going to change your life. More clearing. Somebody else. We got. What are you doing here then? We got it already, she said. What are we doing here then? We're sharing the love and the energy. We're networking with the big guy, <laughs> but, but she pointed upstairs. We're networking with the big guy. That's excellent. That's excellent. I'll tell you what I think is going on. First of all, I got no agenda. He has no agenda. I have no notes. He has no notes. We have no outline. We have no PowerPoint. He has no outline. He has no PowerPoint. I think that we want to go here. And this, to me, I end up calling the whiteboard. The whiteboard can be called zero. The whiteboard can be called God. The whiteboard can be called life.
But as soon as you call the whiteboard anything, including the whiteboard, you're one step removed away from it. I think we want to be at zero. We want to be at the place of zero limits. And anything we say about what we'd like to get out of it, anything we say about what we would like to do, anything we, we say about what this is, anything we say about the beliefs and limitations is all our garbage that we've written on the whiteboard. Now, Mark gave you this wonderful introduction, and it is true. He told me that wild story about this therapist that worked for the mental hospital for the criminally insane who somehow did not work one-on-one -on -one with people. He saw them in the halls, but somehow managed to heal them. I found that man. I interviewed him on the phone at first, and he told me his name, Dr. E. Haleakala Hu Lin. And he said, call me E for short. I said, thank you. I needed that break. So I talked to E and I asked him, is it true that you worked at the mental hospital? Yes. Is it true that you didn't see patients? He said, not professionally. I saw them in the hall. Is it true that you helped heal them? He said, yes. And I said, what did you do? I was profoundly curious. He said, all I did was clear and clean myself. What does that mean? I clear and clean myself and mentally ill criminals get better? It did not compute. So he said, my whole job here, and he meant my whole job on earth, but he was also talking my, my whole job there at the hospital is to clean. Explain that to me. He was very patient. He took 45 minutes with me. He did not know me. He had no idea who I was. He never knew that we would ever meet. He never knew that there would ever be a book. He had no idea we'd ever do seminars together. He was just being open-hearted with me. The divine said, answer the phone. I called. He answered the phone. He answered my questions. What he explained is he would look at patients' charts. Can I pick this up for a second? You can imagine that this is a medical chart. And so he would look at the patient's chart, and he would see that they were a murderer, they were a rapist, they had done something pretty dastardly, they were mentally ill criminals who had been confined in a mental is a hospital, an institution. And as he looked at it, he noticed what he felt within himself which could have been anger, which could have been resentment, which could have been rage, which could have been bitterness, any number of things. Whatever he felt in himself is what he tried to erase. This is what he meant by clearing. He wasn't trying to clear you. He wasn't trying to clear the patient. He was trying to clear what he noticed within himself that participated in the creation of the patient. I didn't understand. I didn't get it. And I said, okay, how did you co-create them? How did you participate in the creation of a mentally ill criminal who you didn't know anything about and knew any, no history of, that you didn't know anything about until I got to the hospital? And then he said the most mind-stretching thing that still boggles my mind, and when we talk about complete responsibility, this has taken it to a level that nobody outside of this room, unless they've read Zero Limits or done a workshop with him, have ever considered and that's the idea that most of you have heard that you create your own reality. I see some heads nodding. In Dr. Len's world, and it's actually Dr. Hu Len, I've shortened it from E to Dr. Len, but it's actually Dr. Hu Len, if you want to say his name correctly. In Dr. Hu Len's world, he says, if you create your own reality and somebody shows up in your reality that happens to be a mentally ill criminal, you created them too. You create your own reality. They're in your reality. This is 100% responsibility to a degree that almost nobody hears about, let alone entertains or tries to live. So I did find him. I did do that interview with him. I did do a seminar. In fact, Mark Ryan and I did the seminar, the first one, together. And I did several seminars with him. I also brought him to Austin where Suzanne and I had set up this dinner party. We thought five people might show up. We had like 75 people who showed up. They were just drawn to this whole idea. And then, of course, we did a preliminary Zero Limit seminar about a year ago in Austin. Didn't advertise it. I just wanted to see if Dr. Hulan and I danced well together. And we danced remarkably well together, letting the divine play the music. So he has agreed to come and do another workshop for today and tomorrow. When I say workshop, that's not making any sense to me. It needs to be called something else. It's not really a workshop. It's not really a play shop. It's not really a seminar. It's some sort of experiential, some sort of splash of the divine. And it is all driven by inspiration.
as you'll be learning that you have a choice. Your choice is to come from inspiration or to come from memory in each moment. And virtually all of us are coming from memory. We're coming from something we've done before. We're coming from past programming. That's what we want to clean. That's what we want to erase. And as you erase that, you start coming from inspiration. And where does inspiration come from? The black, the whiteboard or the blackboard. It comes from here. It's inspired. It just kind of bubbles up. And throughout the weekend, if it occurs to me, I'll tell you various stories about how that's bubbled up for me, how inspiration has just kind of showed up. And I say when inspiration shows up, your part of the deal is is to take action. And then if you're actually clear, you'll automatically take action. That if you get an inspiration and you don't take action, it's because there's some sort of memory there that's causing you to not move forward. So hopefully you're all delightfully confused. (laughs) And that's a wonderful place to be. Confusion is that wonderful state before clarity. So it is a great pleasure, a great honor to bring up here somebody who has deeply influenced my life, somebody who is a co-author for one of the most important books I've written, Zero Limits, the man of the moment, (laughs) Dr. Hu Lin. Is your mic on? I'm going to make sure you're on. Say something. I thought he was, I, I thought he was going to say the man of La Mancha. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to open with a um, greeting in Hawaiian. And the purpose is to, if you brought in any garbage into the room, we're, we want to take that back to zero. Yeah? Pua mai a mai kapo iloko, a kam a lama lama, a vow no kaha, kam mali ola, a vow no kapoho, ke ka eli mavaho a ino ke ao pao, ka i ke kino ihu na me ao pao, ka i ao i ku u pi o na nui nui, mavaho a ino ka ao pao, ka ho o mau mau o mana na o, a me na me ao pao, a vow no kaho. I make a ha, he huna, kamakani, nahi nahi, kahua huna, o kumalipo, o bao no kihi. I am the I. I come forth from the void into light. I am the breath that nurtures life. I am that emptiness, that hollowness beyond all consciousness. The I, the Ed, the all. I draw my bow of rainbows across the waters the continuum of minds with matters. I am the incoming and the outgoing of breath, the invisible, untouchable breeze, the undefinable atom of creation. I am the I. I was in North Carolina doing a, um, doing a class and somebody sent me or gave me there, if I can find it. Somebody sent me a cartoon. And uh, I think it's important to share it with you, just to make sure we're getting clear as to what I'm talking about. So the cartoon is called Cornered, and it's in a bookstore. It could be in Borders or who doesn't matter. So there's a sign that says self-help, and there's only one fellow under there. And then there's another sign that says fixing others. Yeah. So most of us spend most of our lives fixing others. And if you are really pay attention, you will notice it never works. If you're a physician, you think it works, it never works. For example, in this great country of ours, um, by the time a cardiologist is 60 years old, he has a higher incidence of heart problems than the general population. So some of you who, I, I, Joe said I could say anything, so I'm going to say it. <laughs> so some of you who are, quote, healers, um, I'm going to talk to you today particularly, because it's important for you to know what's going on in you. So I'm going to, I'm going to pose five questions today. 
I'm going to kind of address myself to it, and maybe I won't. Maybe it'll show up. Who knows? Yeah. So the first question I'm going to address myself to is, is a question that probably not too many people walking the earth can answer clearly. Clearly. And the question is, who am I? Who am I? As you know, our, the great um, philosopher Socrates says, know thyself. And most people have no idea who they are. And I suspect some of you don't either. Um, so I'm going to go over this to, uh, today or tomorrow, and Joe will give you some stories, and maybe some of you will have some stories. But who am I? And as Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true. But most of us are not. Moment by moment, we're somewhere else, and we're not ourselves. So it's going to be very important to, to at least kind of ad address ourselves to this. And then the other, the other question I'm going to ask is, what is a problem? And most people have no idea what this is. And if you look at the health system today, it's, it's going crazy because nobody in the health system has answered the question, what is the problem? Yeah. So it's a very important to work with that and be very clear, because if you're not clear, you're going to be like a rubber ball bouncing all over the place and causing problems for everybody else. Then the third question I think is very important, and it's the question of 100% responsibility, is the question of where is the problem? Where is the problem? And this, prob what this question deals with being 100% responsible. And I, as I say, um, kind of every class that I've ever given for the 25 years, the, the point always comes up, have you ever noticed that there, every time there's a problem, you are always there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you are always there. Always. No, there's no exception. So we're going to look at where is the problem, because if you're not clear where the problem is, then too bad for the rest of us. Because yeah? as you get clear as to who you are, what is the problem, where the problem is, the rest of us will be fine. <laughs> really. But as long as you can't answer any of this, the rest of us will be in hell, and you will be the creator <laughs> now. Yeah? So it's very important. And then the question is, how can the problem be solved? How can the problem be solved? But how can we solve a problem when we don't even know what the problem is? How can we solve a problem when we don't even know where it is? Truly, we have no idea. I'm going to deal with this, and it's, uh, this, is, this, is, this three and four deal with being 100% responsible. It's very, very, very important to be 100% responsible. And then the fifth question, which I've just thrown in since Japan. I came back from Japan, um, did a class there last weekend. Um, the question is, is what is the purpose of existence? What is the purpose of existence? And nobody knows. Because if you knew, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> really, you would not be here. If you knew what a problem was, you would not be here. You would be wasting your time, wasting it. You could be walking the, the beaches of Maui or, or go up to the place where I live on the Big Island uh, volcano, five miles from an active volcano, and any moment you go, and you're gone. Yeah. <laughs> but since I live part of the year in California, Woodland Hills, you could go, be gone too. <laughs> Here, here's what I'm going to... Joe and I and whoever, I don't know where it's going to go. I don't care where it's going to go, really. I'm, I'm just putting it up. And you're going to be 
you're going to be creating where it goes, and I'm going to be doing what I came to do, and go, oh my God, and then start <laughs> erasing. Yeah. Yeah. So, let's see, where do we begin? That's a, a very important question. Where is it? Where do we begin? Somebody tell me, where do we begin? If, if we're going to solve these, we're going to answer these questions, where do we begin? And be clear. Uh, you know, again, he says he, he's giving permission to be profane. So, uh, most of what you're going to say today is bullshit stuff. I mean, you, you are. You, I've, I've heard it before. It's going to be sheer bullshit. So, I'm, I'm getting ready, and here's what I'm getting ready with. Maybe Joe wants to say something. No, I just have a mic to hand to whoever wants to say something. Right there. Mary. I don't have a clue. Well, you're, you're like everybody else. No. <laughs> Only what happens if you're in California and in Los Angeles, they talk a very good story. <laughs> Yeah, wherever, whatever reason, the Los Angeles oh, folks around Los it. Angeles, they will always say, "I know," and you know it's bullshit stuff. I mean, it is. It's all the bullshit. So maybe somebody would like to contribute to the bullshit. You know. <laughs> so I have here what is called an eraser. So as you're talking, I'm watching the room watching the cosmos, watching the plant, watching all this, and it's only an opportunity for me to erase. So, fire away. And you have to, for me, you so, have to speak very slowly, and I would ask you to stand up so I know where the trash is coming from. Some yeah. Now, now uh, we're going to make the point now. So, listen, he is not talking. I want you to make, I want you to be clear about that. When he speaks, he is not speaking. It's data speaking in his soul. So he's not speaking because if he was at zero, he would have nothing to say. So I'm going to make this point over and over again. That you were created in the exact likeness of the divine. Pure and perfect. Pure. So who you are, who you are is a divine being that's perfect already. But, but you happen to talk trash. Yeah? <laughs> so let's listen to a divine being talk trash. Yes, sir. So once I heard that there are I'm no problems. I'm sorry? Once I heard that there are no problems, but only situations. What does that mean? It means that it becomes a problem because of our understanding it as a problem. No, it becomes a problem because it's data. See, now if, for example, you were at, at zero, you'd be fine, but as soon as you start talking, you're talking, as Joe, Joe uh, Dr. Vitale is saying, you're talking this, this, but you hear who you are. But when you talk trash, this echoes the trash. But if you were already perfect, you wouldn't say anything. Zero. So what you're saying is nonsense. So I'm going to hit like that because I want to make sure you don't get away with bullshit. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now where you want to be, so I'm going to erase the board and I want you to watch this. You will know, you will, you will realize I cannot erase zero, but I can erase data. So I'm going to erase the data, and as I erase the data, I'm leaving you behind. This is you. This is what Shakespeare called blank. This is what Goethe in Faust calls stillness. This is what Jesus called purity of soul. This is what people like uh, Buddha says, void. So when you're at void, you're free, clear.
peace beyond all comprehension. This is you. This is chaos. This is chaos on you. This is disease. This is problem. And this is what Buddha calls suffering. That when the data plays, which is a memory replaying, as Dr. Vitale pointed out, you're, in, you're stuck. I don't care what you say. It's trash. But now, if you're willing to let go... Can I add one thing? Oh, please be my guest. <laughs> so... He said, I have a problem, but he heard that he can call it, I have a situation. I'm writing it down so that you can visibly see that this is just data reframed with a different word in it. It is still a program. It is still trash. It is still something that can be erased. It's exactly the same thing. You just used a different word on it, but that word was also taking you away from zero. Taking you away from yourself. Pure in heart. You have given up. Don't go away, Dr. Vitale. <laughs> come, come. So you have given up yourself, pure in heart, for trash. Trash. I mean, how... how I mean, can you imagine giving up a pure soul for trash? And this is what we do moment to moment. We're trashy. <laughs> yeah. For example, some of you have this notion that you're a healer. It's trash. Some of you who think you're coaches, it's trash. Because if you're hanging around somebody who, who needs to be coached, all you have to do is erase the stuff and the person will be fine. <laughs> because if you are at zero, everybody else will be at zero. So, so when I work with people who come and see me over the years, I try not to. But when, I, when they call or get an email that slips in, I don't know how they got, I, I say to myself, what's going on in me? that they should give, be giving me a litany, data, trash of their problems. And so now as I begin to erase the, erase the trash in me, it gets erased in them, and they never email me again. <laughs> now, the only thing I don't know, and Mr. Joe Vitale will have to tell me, is, is how to build them. <laughs> <laughs> So please be clear, like he's pointed out, you are zero. This is called freedom. Freedom is no, no trash. Clarity. Peace beyond all understanding. This is who you are. He and I were on a radio show together, and we were getting a lot of call-in questions, and we were getting a lot of call-in uh, comments. Before my book came out, our book, no, this was mine, but Zero Limits was by both of us, he said, Joe, when the book comes out, the shit is going to hit the fan. And I said, no problem, I can handle it, until the first shit hit the fan. <laughs> and I didn't handle it very well. I had a whole lot of cleaning to do within me. We ended up doing a radio show together that he probably remembers, and he interrupted the host and he said, do you have any really nasty questions? We, we, were, we were having all kinds of sweet kind of response, um, question. And I said to him, let's go after a nasty one, you know? And so the announcer said, somebody by the name of Chris has this really strong question. And I was bracing myself to hear it. It's like, I, didn't, I wasn't inviting this. I don't want to hear this. I'm doing just fine in my little bubble. So don't, don't bring it in. He was inviting it. Why was he inviting it first? Opportunity for clearing. But he said something that was a real eye-opener for me. He said that the person asking the question isn't asking the question. It is a data, it is a program, it is a belief, whatever you want to call that, was being spoken through the person. This is why therapy never works. Because what, as he's pointing out, when somebody says something to you, it's not about that. But we, we who have been trained, including parents, we keep thinking that's what they're saying. But the, you never hear what they say because you're always reacting. You're only hearing your reaction to what they're saying. Yeah. Just having that awareness 
that the person asking the question wasn't um, wasn't trying to debt me on purpose. What they were really doing was expressing what I sometimes called a virus of the mind, that they had actually just picked up a virus and that they were expressing it, much like somebody picks up a cold, that they weren't doing it intentionally, that they had no responsibility for it because they were unaware of it, but because it was coming through that, instead of seeing a person named Chris in this case who was asking a question, I now heard that data came through a person named Chris, and what I wanted to clean was the data. And I was recognizing the data because the data was in me. Take it slowly now. Let's go through that one more time because some of the people are going, eh. <laughs> uh, one more time. What I'm looking for when everybody comes to, anybody comes to me and they say something nice about that book or any of my work or they say something negative, perceived as negative about that book or any other work, is I'm now looking at it's not the person telling me it, it's not you expressing it, that you actually have picked up a cold, a virus, a program. And these programs are in us, they're in the universe. There is, this is one thing that he's depressed me with. He says there's such, there's an unimaginably huge amount of cleaning to do that we will actually never ever get it done in this lifetime. And I was really looking for the easy button, push it, you know, and everybody's cleaned, especially me first. But the, the point is, is that whatever I'm noticing in somebody else, I'm only noticing it in somebody else because it's in me. And so instead of trying to clean the other person, which isn't going to work because the thing is in me, I've noticed it, I have to clean within me. And I'm at the point that I'm doing it nonstop to the best of my ability. And I'll tell you how I do it once we get through this, but I wanted to go and uh, reiterate it. So anybody unclear about what he said? Because if you give me a chance to say I have a I can erase it because it's trash. So anything that comes up in your mind, including a question, can be erased. Because once you leave this room, you're going to have questions that can be erased. If you don't, if you don't get to erasing them, you're going to be stuck in the data. It's going to kill you. Example, there was a woman in um, uh, Fort Collins. There was a woman in Fort Collins, raised her hand, and she said to me, Dr. Hewlin, um, I did the cleaning, but I had a flat tire. And I go, <laughs> what's the big deal? And as I was watching, here's, here's what I was watching, my mind cleaning, because she didn't, she wasn't saying what she was saying. I was watching. I did my cleaning. As I was watching the cleaning, here's what I heard. So when you clean, here's what you're going to hear. It's called inspiration. You got to be at zero. You got to give it up, the trash. So now here's what I, this is what, this is called inspiration. It's called inspire, what the Hawaiians call ha. The ha is equivalent to inspire. And if you take this word and you attach it to the word, to the, to the word alo, ha. Do you know what aloha means? <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Trash. Tell, tell me what aloha really means. Yes, to be in the presence of God. So if I say aloha to my friend here, I'm acknowledging I'm in the presence of God and I shouldn't be screwing around. Because if whatever, if I'm, if I'm angry with him, it's being angry against God. So just one, just want to share that with you, just as a side note. So aloha means to be in the presence of Okay, so now inspiration comes in, and I hear. Here, here's what's going on. So as I was doing my cleaning, I heard the many say to me, three generations from now, her great, 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 great grandson would have been born retarded. Can I say that again? So... Doing the cleaning, the opportunity to clean, presented a memory from producing in her family a retarded person. Let's kind of hang around with that a little bit. Maybe you kind of pay attention. You ought to do more cleaning. 
be more at zero? I mean, really. In, um, in, in Charlotte, I was doing a class in Charlotte. A woman says, I only have a small question, Dr. Ulan. Bullshit stuff. <laughs> so the question comes up, and I'm cleaning. I'm watching my mind, seeing what's coming up. I'm cleaning, and I'm watching it. And I hear the divinity say to me, ask her a question just to see what she will do. And I went, blah, 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 and up she came. And what I saw, and I, I did the cleaning with, lunchtime, I went to lunch, and she came to see me because I already know what the problem was. She had, she had a suicide. That's what I was working on. All the, all the women in this world who feel down, dislocated, unloved, uncared for, commit suicide. In Japan, where I just came from, 30,000 people a year commit suicide. Yeah, but don't you commit suicide in your mind? Yeah, you do it all the time. So the, the point is, what, what Joe Vitale and I are pointing out, you better get to zero. Don't try to figure anything out. If you have a question in this room, that's great. Outside of this room, if you hang around with questions, it's going to take you down. It's going to take you down. I'm only here to say hello. We're, we're going to handle questions in this room, but I want to know the questions will take you more. Yes? I've heard some people you just can, say... You can, you can stand up okay. so I can see you, please. I've heard some people just repeat, you know, uh, I'm sorry. No, 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 you didn't hear that. You heard yourself hearing okay. them repeat. Well, I read it in an email. No, you didn't read it in an email. <laughs> you read your reaction to it. That's why I'm saying you can be cleaning with this stuff instead of hanging around with it. When you say, so Joe Vitale said, you didn't say that. It's your thoughts are saying that's what Joe Vitale said. You never heard it straight. You'll never hear it straight. The data will never give you the answer. Never, never, never. My question was, it didn't seem to be addressing anything in particular, and I'm wondering if the cleaning should be have a subject. What, why is that? Huh? Why is that? I don't know. I'm well, asking. I don't know either. You don't know? No. Why? But you, you'll never know. That's the point I'm telling you. If you say, I love you, you don't know what divinity is going to do. You're not the one that's going to heal. Divinity is going to heal. You have to be responsible. But you can't, you don't have any idea what's going to be worked on. So if I just went around saying... No, no, you've got to be careful about saying that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, can you, you give you, us some guidelines? Because that's what I'm here to learn. Yeah, but the guideline is just say, I love you. All the time? Well, if you want to do it all the time. But that, that's the guideline, is be 100% responsible. And the way to be 100% responsible is start cleaning so you can get to zero. And what about the, I'm sorry, forgive me? Now, now you're getting fancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, just uh, trying to follow all the instructions. No, you're not trying. No, no. <laughs> what you're trying to do is you're trying to stay stuck in the data. Just get to the cleaning. If, you get, if you're trying to figure things out, you're going to get stuck and swallowed up by the data. I'm only here to say, just get to the cleaning. Forget how come, why, should I do it this way, that way. Just do it. Okay. See, she, now, now, now she, you're rippling over here, and she's got a question, but it's trash, too. Okay. <laughs> because if, if you and I were at zero, you wouldn't be asking all this. Now I'm saying to these people who are watching you, they think it's you and me, but it's a trash in them. <laughs> yeah. I know it's a very different way, so just get to the cleaning. That's the story. Forget about trying to figure out what's going on. The intellect will not have... Listen, watch this. I, I just want to make a point over here, because it's, uh, it's very important for you to know. So let, let this be the conscious mind. Let this be the subconscious. For every one byte of information that this is a, that this is aware of, one million it's not aware of. So, so at any given second, it's 15, 15 bytes per second conscious. So it's 15 million. 15 million you're not aware of, huh? Yeah. yeah. And you're saying I know. 
You're saying, what, I'm going to clean a specific thing? No, just say I love you. Thank you. Forget about trying to get it. Look at this intellect part of you. Trying to figure everything out. Look at this stuff. When, when there's a tumultuous kind of activity going below your consciousness. So the story is, I'm only here to, to I guess, promote it. Just clean. Give up trying to. Yeah. Now she's going to be talking. You have a. Now she's going to be talking. You have an opportunity to clean now because it's trash. I thank you for that. Yeah. Well, it is trash. I'm going to tell tell her it's trash. I know it's because trash. Because if she was at zero, I'm going. This is. He told me it's okay to be really pointed. So if you if you're at zero, you'd be you wouldn't be clean. You wouldn't be speaking. And if she has a question, she could have cleaned it. And she wouldn't have it. But now we're going to have to put up with it because she's giving, <laughs> because she's giving you a chance to clean. You, you, you understand this? She's giving every one of you a chance to clean. But you're just sitting there because you think it's her problem. <laughs> no. So let's hear what, what the trash is. As I'm cleaning. No, no, you're asking anyway. What do you mean as you're no, cleaning? No, as I'm cleaning. Yeah. Does it have to come from the heart? Or the intellect, or both. See, this is Los Angeles stuff. <laughs> yeah. in, in Los Angeles, where I, where I do a lot of training, because I have to be there, because I get to clean up the stuff in me. Los Angeles people are saying, "Do you have to mean it, Doctor Yule?" <laughs> I mean, and so I said to the, I said, I would say to them, "Show me how you would mean it." They go, "No, you don't have to." When you hit a delete button, you don't have to mean it, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you know, all of the woes and trouble of creation sits in this room. And if you're not willing to be 100% responsible, this war in Iraq will go on, the health system will go on, um, 30,000 people will commit suicide because you are not being 100% responsible. <laughs> so I'm only here to say, hello, just clean. That's your job. And divinity who can heal, only divinity can heal, will come down and say, oh my God, thank God they said I love you. You know that old saying, love thy enemy? You've heard of that? So who, who are you loving when you do the cleaning? Yourself. Oh, see, that's what I'm saying. You're loving what? Your enemy is who? Your trash. That's who you're loving. When, you, when you're angry, you're loving that to allow God to consume that. When you're at zero, only then will you be in love with yourself. But you can't be in love with yourself unless you have enemies running around called trash, anger, resentment, annoying, thinking, coping, managing, God knows everything else. So to love your enemies is to love your trash. Love whatever is going on for which you have no idea. The 15 million going on below your consciousness. 15 million enemies, what Shakespeare called poor soul. This is the soul for Shakespeare. Poor soul. These rebel powers that derail. So Shakespeare has already got it 400 something years ago, saying, Here are your rebel powers. These are your only enemies. Once you get rid of them by, by being a wonderful. One per hundred percent responsible. I love you, thank you, all of that. Get rid of the trash immediately. Seek ye first the kingdom, which is zero, and everything else will be added. You get it automatically. But you won't seek it if you're trying to figure out what's going on. How come? Why do I have to do it this way? Do I have to mean it? And we're all stuck. Yes. Remember, this is you get to clean with this. It's on on the upside. Yes. He is my trash. Um, you have like I've been cleaning, letting go. That's my trash. And um, what happens when you are doing that, and you actually feel like you're just getting worse? You have to and go actually, slower and louder so I can understand. What happens when you're cleaning and you feel like you're getting worse? I don't see. I don't. Hear what you're saying. You, 
No, you should be cleaning. <laughs> You know, you should be cleaning. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But you can't be impure in heart and you've got trash running around. So let, let me hear it one more time as I clean. So make a, make, be very specific. Give me for an example. Okay. Um, I started clear. Well, I have been clearing. Yes. But I also find it harder to get out of bed and deal with the pain and the tiredness all the time. And then it gets to a stage where I can't clear any wall. I found it even very difficult to get here and keep going. Yeah, so I'm going to show you how to do it today. You can do it automatically without being conscious of it. I'm going to show you how to do that. But I have to get through the trash. Yes? Yes? What do you think about if you're not thinking about anything? It's bullshit what you're thinking about. <laughs> it's bullshit. You're not at zero. I'm trying to get you back to zero. Well, but but you're you're giving me bullshit stuff. Yes, probably. Yeah, not probably. You are. Yeah. So I'm saying to you that if that guy was cleaning, you wouldn't have asked that asked that question. But see, he thinks it's you. I mean, really, because you can only ask a question if he had it in him already. You guys need to know that that all of the woes and problems are already in you. You already came in. So if you were going to ask that question, you've asked it a million times. But he was around too. He could have been cleaning. Had he cleaned, you would not have asked that. He would have, he would have erased it. You know, this is really beautiful if you're willing to be yourself. So why don't we just all ask crazy questions and just Well, because you're going to be like you. There's going to be people around you because you're asking questions. You're making comments. But can you imagine if you were constantly cleaning Everybody would be in heaven. You know, that's what they do. This is the, what the training of folks around this, all of you. You're, you're going to help people. What a, what a bunch of bullshit. Stuff. <laughs> you're the problem. So now, let's say, let's say he's a client. He's going to come and see me. I have, a, um, I have a, a schedule. He's going to see me next week. Boy, I start cleaning. With whatever I have with him, I'm going to start cleaning. Because when he shows up, we will have an easy time, have coffee, and he'll pay me 250 bucks. Yeah. You know? I mean, right, but why couldn't you do it? Because you think you're going to help him. He doesn't need help. He's already perfect. What is imperfect is the data in you that says otherwise. That says otherwise. All of you walking around. You're, so we, see, we say, well, he's got a problem. No, we got a problem. And I'm here to tell you, listen, it's over here. It's only over here. It's only and it's only data. Everybody's perfect. The universe is absolutely God only creates perfect universe. Well, my God, what is imperfect? Just the data. The data where in you. And if you don't get to it by being a hundred, we're all going to be stuck. I'm going to be doing my cleaning, but if some if you get stuck by thinking coping, boy. This is the 15 million going on. I'm going to be doing my cleaning, but some of this data I will not be aware of if you're in Thailand somewhere goofing off. I'm going to be stuck, and so will my grandchildren, my grand great-grandchildren, and we'll have the wars over, another Vietnam, another, because none of us are 100% responsible. So the only question is, are we going to get 100% responsible? And how do we do that? Simply, like Joe Vitale says, just painting. So you can be zero, and once you're zero, everybody else can be zero. So here is the way it works. Simple to do, but I'm showing you three states of being, only three states.